Chapter 5. This is the final chapter, and in this chapter we're going to learn how to build and ensure that our success continues. And what in our strategy should ensure that our success continues? That is answered by three tests, three dynamic tests. First, is that a good internal fit? Is the strategy a good internal fit? And you can ask this question by, does the theory offer a coherent account of added value is actually built over time? Meaning this strategy that we are proposing, is it actually going to add value? So it should, it should be a good internal fit to what the mission of the company is, to the mission of the org is, to what the dynamic of the company that you're operating in. It should have a good internal fit. So that theory, that strategy should offer a very co coherent, comprehensive, well thought out, added value. Second, it should have a good external fit. It should be sustainable in the face of imitation, right? Does it explain how added value can be sustained in the face of imitation? Can it handle imitations? The strategy has to be good with handling imitators. Third, it should be good with handling substitution threats. And how do you do that? Does it offer valuable insights on how to deal with change, especially fundamental business landscape changes? When things are changing, when Marriott and others are being um, disrupted by Airbnb, it's a business landscape change. So does this strategy pass this test? If it passes these three tests, then we are sure that our strategy is ensuring uh, that our success is sustainable. So there are three ways in which you can look at this activity system based, which is this is the activity diagram of Southwest Airlines, where the darker circles are their key strategic overarching themes, which is they have limited passenger amenities, high aircraft, aircraft utilization, low ticket price, low cost carrier, lean and productive ground staff, which high level of morale and highly paid and compensated and frequent reliable departures and on-time arrivals, right? So these are their broad activities that there are strategically important for them. And you can draw out the activity in the system to understand like where are the resources, what, what is, does, does this fit in into this activity system? Um, but remember the activity system is, is, is like looking at the balance sheet. It gives you a point in time understanding of how the company is, how the system is, but it does not change, does not handle, uh, or does not answer questions like, how does this change over time? Uh, what is the, what, how does this evolve? How does it, uh, what are the inertia points? How do we make major changes? It doesn't answer any of this, but, but it gives you some lens of like looking at the strategy to validate an activity system view is one such approach. Um, the second one is resource-based, like you treat everything as a resource, your employees as a resource, your, uh, you know, if you are an aircraft carrier, then your planes as your resource, then your, the hub that you operate with as your resource, and then you see the activities that they do. Like, let's say you have a designated uh, employee for uh, case handling when there is a flight that is, you know, has to go on time, so that's a designated responsibility for that, and you see for all of these resources, what activities it performs and is it actually like uh, performing it well. So this this is more decentralized, it's more like resource micro view of how the resources are uh, individually fitting in. So you can apply strategy through resource-based views as well. Like let's say you come up with a strategy that says, hey, our flight time's always late um, because uh, it starts off late. So we need a dedicated resource just for this. So then you can put in that resource um, but think about this, right? Like when you have a resource-based view and if you want to change this entire system, let's say now Southwest wants to move to um, long haul flights, which they don't typically do, then there's going to be so many resources involved and they'll come up with an activity system. So it doesn't, so there is, there's got to be a combination of both activity system and a resource system if you want to make big sweeping changes. So that's where there is this third view, which is the dynamic view. So here we look at your resources that you have that you are potentially going to be capable of funding through the capital. And then you commit those resources to certain um, certain things that you want them to work on. And those are the activities. So you commit. So there are resources with this contract are committed to activities and that helps you build capabilities. And there are these 
additional feedback loops that that you can build which, which tells you that hey there are resources there's activities and there's capability this capability is not in the in the in the textbook but I, i've added it because i think it it, it did say that uh, it's building towards capabilities um, so if you combine the resource base and activity base with feedback loops in terms of like hey you're going to get these commitment of these resources if you perform those activities well it, it ensures accountability then you are actually looking at the whole system fully. These are three different ways to look at the system so that uh, your strategy is validated, right? And there's a there's a conscious two-step view between commitment and activities because you want to make sure that um, those commitments that, let's say you make a big change and, hey, we're going to move all of these people from these commitments to this activity, which is new strategy, then you would want to make sure that there is a step between because it takes time for people to move it takes time people to learn right so remember that point and in, in in all of these right there are two two things to keep in mind the opportunity cost if you act slowly and if you do incremental changes and your competitor is making big sweeping changes then you would lose out on the first movers advantage uh, but at the same time, you're also locked in. If you take decision too hastily and you, you move in much more quickly, quicker, and then you have not thought through those scenarios that you should have thought through, then you're locked into a major uh, sunk cost, which could be pretty expensive as well. So big strategic changes should be thought through fully, but for those decisions that can be made quickly, should be made quickly. Right? So think about multiple scenarios and then think about the system holistically to validate that your strategy works. There's going to be uncertainties and there are these and you'd have to attack them head on. So let's look at all of these five uncertainties and what we should do about them. So the strategy could be a failing strategy. It could just lead to persistent inferior performance. In that case, you'd want to figure out like what are those scenarios of failures and how do we handle them? Is it actually doable? Can we like what at what point will we like stop? Right. What are the milestones at which we will stage and check that it's actually working? And there's, that's where you can have the burn to burn ratio, learn to burn ratios, which is basically how much information are you getting about the progress and work and efficiency and uh, moving towards the goal versus the rate of sunk cost. So if, if, if you're keeping adding more and more people, resources, money and others, but you're, you're not really improving, you're not getting that signal of improvement, your metrics, your true north metrics are not moving, then it's a low learn to burn ratio. You really want high learn to burn ratio, then you can, you can do that through efficient measurements. So in this, what we're trying to do, we're trying to make sure that we are considering all the scenarios. We're trying to make sure that we can handle failures. Uh, and we are trying to come up with ideas that are attractive, like you've thought through the whole thing. And, and in this, the final thing is, right, the uncertainty happens because we've not made a critical look at our capabilities internally. Every org um, is in different phase. Every company is in a different culture state. Right? So the chances of winning meet certain characteristics and if you don't have those characteristics and you take those risks that are big, then those uncertainties will most likely come to be true. So attacking these uncertainties, thinking through um, having guardrails in place and then critically analyzing your core capabilities is important to make sure that you don't take on too much. There are strategic inflection points uh, in every company uh, every so many years, right? Uh, and depending on how fast your landscape is moving in your organization, in your company, industry, there could be multiple such inflection points. But inflection point is basically a time in the life of a business when its fundamentals are about to change. That change could mean an opportunity to rise to new heights, but it may just likely signal the beginning or the end, right? If Intel didn't 10x their efficiency when their chips had like let's say floating point errors they didn't improve on their you know uh, um, production efficiency then they would have been they would have been long gone right so there are in internet low cost pc these are all strategic inflection points for for a company like intel so in your company also there will be like those inflection points wherein those big bold decisions have to be made to threat off the imitators or handle the switching um switching uh, threats that are uh, coming through innovative companies. So those strategic inflection points, be very mindful. This also includes strategic leadership changes, right? Like if, if those core key people 
who were the core of the core, if they move, then those are inflection points. So what are those inflection points and how are you taking those signals to improve and adapt is important. And depending on the landscape, you could be in a stable landscape where evolution is more important, like co cooperation, much more co you know, uh, collaborative work, versus dynamic landscape when things are changing every every year or two. Then you 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 want like a revolutionary kind of a mindset. So the difference is evolutionary versus revolutionary, and even the resources, org design, rewards, policy, work environment, standards, everything has to change based on the landscape you're in. You'd have to adapt and change. Like you'd want to prioritize compliance, commitment, and uh, incremental product delivery for for a stable company, for a stable landscape. It's an evolutionary. But if you're in a dynamic landscape, you you want to come up with new ideas, new product investments, and you would want to put in more and more people to it. Or design also could be centralized versus decentralized um, to really empower more people to come up with new ideas, bottom-up thinking. Um, and rewards is tied to individual performance versus business performance, right? So stretch goals defined in terms of production level versus delivery dates, right? So depending on the type of the company you are in, these doesn't have to be in these two extremes, you can be somewhere in the middle. But check if the resources, if your policy, if your work design, if your reward structure, if the way you hire people, if the policies and culture that you have, um, is it around you know quality, is it around creativity, is, like what is that dominant thing? You have to match that. If not, your strategy is not aligned. And that comes with the behavioral dynamics that we covered in the previous video. So it's very important to recognize where you are and adapt. So there are five point success formula based on all of these five chapters I read. Just, you should be able to adapt uh, and learn to spot new opportunities, like spot new opportunities. Um, look at how competitive landscape is working. Make a daring, bold commitment once you are, when, once you know that you need to innovate, once you know you need to change. And then build those core capabilities. Invest using that commitment to build excellence. R&D capabilities gradually, one step at a time, can be improved to such an extent, like the Intel, Andy Grove. He's, he's done a phenomenal work, right? Exploit opportunities. Once you have done all of this, it's time to go take the product to the market. And make sure that in this process that you are heavily emphasizing the culture, right? We talked about like which landscape you're in. Make sure that you're organizing for the right allocation of people towards the future needs, the design of org, hiring the right set of people, bringing in the right people, making sure the right people leave. Make sure you, you build and are adaptable, right? Either you have to at some point build deep capabilities or at some point you'd have to go towards more adaptable so that you can actually meet the customer demand to increase adoption. So strategically changing that mindset is quite important um, and to be able to adapt. Finally, three pieces of inspiration from Andy Grove from this chapter. Um, if top management is able to let the chaos reign and then rein in the chaos, such a dialectic can be very productive. Powerful, isn't it? If you let, if you know that there's there's a problem and you can actually handle it, uh, then then you can actually use that dynamic, chaotic, energetic field to power the resources towards the goals that you want to get to. And the core strategic challenge, given this is the last chapter, after this we're going to do case studies, is knowing as leaders when to change the peak that you're trying to climb is as important as climbing towards a particular peak. You might be focused, dedicated onto, you know, all of your resources onto a project and people and initiative, but that could be the end of that peak. You want to start noticing that you have to let go, let go of that peak and then join the new peak and then resource move all of your resource towards that new peak. So that is strategic challenge, otherwise you will be disrupted. And the final leadership challenge is the real test of leadership then is to be able to compete successfully, increasing the alignment of fit among strategy, structure, culture, and processes, while simultaneously preparing the inevitable revolutions for the inevitable revolutions required by environmental changes. So this requires organization management skills to compete in a mature market where cost, efficiency, incremental innovations are key, and develop new ideas and services where radical innovation, speed, and flexibility are critical. Look at, look at the amount of message you just shared in these two paragraphs. Daring, visionary leaders need to understand all of these competing themes around strategies, structure, culture, 
and be ready for those revolutionary changes because only then can you reduce your costs, only then can you improve your efficiency, innovate, that's actually required so that the speed and flexibility with which you operate can actually build for a strategy, build on a strategy that's successful. So a lot of inspiring things uh, in this chapter. Good luck and go buy the book. This book is pretty amazing. I have hardly shared 1%, but this book by Pankaj Himawat is an absolute, absolute classic uh, on strategy. You see these mountains that are rugged. It's basically showing that uh, uh, strategy is like climbing these rugged mountains. You know, sometimes the peak is over and then you have to, you know, the second peak that you have to climb. So it's pretty interesting. The, the text and the cases are so detailed. I learned quite a bit on strategy. The other book that I would highly recommend to you reading is the Seven Powers book, which I have done a chapter by chapter review. It's a primer on strategy. This book is much more detailed. So I would recommend if you are interested in strategy that you check out that book as well. Thanks.